So what we're gonna do is look at the respiratory system and it's a nice dovetailing with the cardiovascular system too, because we talked about a big part of what the cardiovascular system does is transporting oxygen to your cells and taking away the, you know, the carbon dioxide. And we're going to see more how that happens. So respiratory system, or spores, respiratory system. Or if we were in a, some other country, one of my professors would lecture on the respiratory system, but I'm going to say the respiratory system. Um, so what are, what's it doing? What's the respiratory system doing for you? Oxygenating your blood. Yeah, exactly. So a big part is going to be oxygenating blood, right? The oxygen is in the room and you got to get it into your bloodstream. That's going to be the whole point of the lungs is we're going to have to bring the air into the lungs from outside. And then from the alveoli, the lungs have the oxygen transfer into the bloodstream where it can get transported to all of your cells. And then we also have to pick up the wastes, like the CO2 and get rid of it. Um, other things that the respiratory system does, we're gonna see is actually important for pH balance. Um, that will make more sense in a few moments when we look at how carbon dioxide is dealt with in the bloodstream. But basically carbon dioxide um, gets converted into carbonic acid. And so by increasing or decreasing your pulmonary ventilation, you actually change your pH by quite a bit. And so it's gonna be one of the important things in pH balance. We've already seen the um, role of buffer systems to control pH, do pH homeostasis. The respiratory system is also gonna be an important part of pH homeostasis. Um, vocalization, right? Your vocal cords are in your larynx. You know, they make the vibration sound that then you can mold into your words and stuff, right? One of the problems, like if you're choking and you can't breathe, you also can't call for help. Right, it's like if you're at the dinner table and I'm choking, you can't say like, I'm choking, please help me. Um, what is the symbol to let people know that you are choking or suffocating? Yeah. Right, if that way people know that something's wrong because you can't call for help because without having that airflow, you can't make your vocal cords vibrate. So that's an important part of it as well. Um, all right, so let's look at some of the basic processes of the respiratory system. And the first part we're gonna say is pulmonary ventilation. Pulmonary is just the adjective having to do with the lungs. Pulmonary ventilation is basically working the bellows, getting the air from the room down into your lungs and getting the air in your lungs out back into the room. So we'll talk a bunch about how that process works. You know, once the air is in the lungs, we need to move it into the actual bloodstream. And that part is officially called external respiration. maneuver because my battery's getting low. So external respiration is basically O2 
from lungs into blood. You know, this is going to be driven by partial pressures of oxygen. You know, and it's going to leave the space in the lungs and get picked up um, almost all of it by the hemoglobin on your red blood cells. Now, then there's going to be the transport, which we've been talking about. That's just the blood flow, right? We move the oxygenated blood all over the place through that 100,000 miles of blood vessels. Um, and then once the blood is in the tissues near the cells, we're gonna have what's called internal respiration. O2 from blood into the tissues. You know, this is also gonna be driven by partial pressures of oxygen. Oxygen is gonna flow from higher to lower partial pressure. Um, you know, and then why do we have to deliver oxygen to the cells? What's the thing that's going on? Why, what's the whole point of breathing? Cellular respiration. Yeah, exactly. So you are. Right, and that we've already talked about. But yeah, I mean, the whole point of breathing is so we can actually do cellular respiration in the mitochondria and make our ATP for all our cellular processes that need energy. All right, so what I'm gonna do is look at each of these. Um, we've already pretty much dealt with the transport. We're gonna talk about the pulmonary ventilation, how you actually get the air down into your lungs. We'll talk a bit about the parameters responsible for the air moving into your bloodstream. And finally, we'll talk about some of the things that influence the release of oxygen from the red blood cells into the tissue. Um, we have to talk a little bit about the anatomy for this all to make sense. So maybe I'll do that. Maybe, no, I will do that. So this is your thoracic cavity here. 10 a.m. It's the place inside your rib cage. What forms the kind of lower boundary of the thoracic cavity? Diaphragm. Diaphragm muscle. Um, you know, below the diaphragm, we are then in the abdominal pelvic cavity. Um, so in your head, you've got two ways to get air in. You can either come in through your nostrils into your nasal cavity, or you can come in through your mouth into the oral cavity. They both meet up together in the back. Maybe I should. Nasal cavity, oral cavity, both meet up in the back of the throat here. Um, we'll talk a bit more about why it's good to breathe in through your nose. Um, obviously, the pathway from your mouth is also going to be used for food, right? So this kind of junction here, my little laryngeal pharynx can go two ways. It can either go down to my lungs if I'm breathing or down to my stomach through the esophagus if I'm eating. So better. Here's my larynx, kind of your little voice box. It has a little flappy doodle called the epiglottis. 
Oh, let me draw this better. There's one, like the esophagus to the stomach. If I'm eating, I'm gonna send whatever's coming down my throat down to the esophagus. But if I am breathing, I'm gonna go down the trachea, your windpipe into the lungs. So that epiglottis is important. That ep I kind of drew it kind of bad here. Imagine it like a little, like a little door at the entrance to the trachea there. So like when you swallow food, that little epiglottis will fold down and block the entrance to the trachea so you don't choke on your food. If you're swallowing food, you obviously need to have it going down the esophagus to the stomach and not down into your lungs. Because if it does go into your lungs, it does happen sometimes, it goes down the trachea, in which case you're going to <coughs> get rid of it, um, get it out. Like that's what coughing is. Coughing is trying to clear these lower respiratory passages that might have stuff in them. Um, The trachea branches, and we'll talk about that in more detail. We have the lungs themselves. The lungs are surrounded by a serous membrane. If you remember, serous membrane is that double membrane with that slippery fluid in between. So as the lungs expand and contract, they're not gonna rub themselves raw against the walls of the thoracic cavity. So there's gonna be two parts to this. There's gonna be, let me draw this right better. Gonna be, an inner layer of visceral, we're gonna call the visceral pleura. Which is the layer of the serous membrane that's actually against the lung tissue itself. Then there's also gonna be the parietal pleura. The parietal pleura is the area, the one that's against the body wall. Um, and what's really important is even though they are two layers with that slippery fluid, they're basically right up against each other. It's like two wet sheets with almost no space in between. And there's a suction in between that's gonna be super important. So that suction is important because the lungs don't have any kind of muscle to move. Instead, you have muscle in your diaphragm. You have muscles like that move your ribs around to expand your, your thoracic cavity. So as the size of the thoracic cavity changes due to these different muscles, either the diaphragm or the intercostals or other muscles we'll talk about, the lungs are gonna get pulled along because of this suction between the two pleura, right? So if my thoracic cage is expanding and my diaphragm is going down, this suction is gonna cause the lungs to also increase in volume. So that suction is gonna be a critical part of what we're gonna call pulmonary ventilation. Um, so we'll come back to that in a few moments. Um, let's talk a little bit about just how you keep from getting all sorts of crap in your lungs. <laughs> 
kind of filtering of the air. Um, one way you filter the inhaled air is first stage, just nose hairs, right? The little, I'm sure everybody has noticed they have nose hairs. Some people it's more obvious than others. They have an official name, Vibrissi. So if you're breathing in a big piece of lint, it's gonna get caught in the nose hair. But let's say it's a smaller little thing that then goes up into your nasal cavity. Your nasal cavity, as well as the trachea in the lower passages, are all covered with this ciliated um, pseudostratified epithelium. So let me put that on another sheet here. So main thing to know about this respiratory epithelium is it is ciliated. And you all know cilia are the little things that sweep stuff along the surface. These goblet cells are little mucus glands. So if I go back to our person here. Both your nasal passages, your passages here. This epithelium is lining, let me do another color here maybe. It's lining the upper regions here. It's not lining in your mouth actually, because obviously the mouth is, is gonna be having to deal with friction. That's where you have like the stratified squamous. So if you're eating food, but, and then it's also lining these lower parts here. And what this does is it has this mucus, which is basically like sticky. So if you get dust and you're breathing in dust, it will stick to the mucus, either up in your nasal cavities, or if it gets lower, it'll stick to the mucus down in the lower respiratory passages. And then these little cilia will sweep it. And it always, if it's in the upper part, it will sweep it down to the back of the throat. If it's here, it'll sweep it up, but basically, it takes it, remember where we had that, there's the esophagus. Basically all this mucus is going and ultimately ending up right at the base of the esophagus there and you swallow it as it builds up. In fact, you're not even noticing it, but every once in a while you're swallowing, actually not that pretty frequently. In fact, right now that you're thinking about it, I bet you you're realizing, oh, I kind of got to swallow because I got kind of mucus building up in the back of my throat. So this mucus, sometimes, especially this lower part, they'll call like the mucus escalator because you have just the dust and crap getting stuck in the mucus and then getting swept up to the back of the throat. Or again, if it's in the upper part, swept down to the back of the throat where you swallow it and then it just goes plops in the hydrochloric acid in your stomach and it's gone. So that's a big part of helping protect your lungs from getting dust inside. Um, you know, the other things that happen in your 
respiratory passages. It helps humidify and warm the air to help, you know, make sure that the delicate lung tissue is not going to get get stressed out by dry, cold air and stuff. So this mus this escalator tends to get paralyzed, like, like for smoking, for instance, these cilia aren't working as well when people smoke. And then you have to more manually <coughs> get that mucus up rather than just allow the little cilia to, to sweep it up. So the mucus escalator. So what I want to do now, let's, um, Let's talk about let's talk about pulmonary ventilation, how you actually get the air in and out of your lungs. Um, we need to do a really quick review of some basic gas law. The main one that's going to be important here is Boyle's law. Boyle's lamb law. Um, this is basically saying there's an inverse relationship between the pressure of a gas and the volume that it is um, inhabiting. The pressure is proportional to the inverse of the volume. And it's pretty intuitive if you really think, what is pressure? Pressure is just force per area. So if I think of an ideal gas as just a bunch of little molecules zipping around, and I have some box, and I have some little molecules, some gas, the gas is zipping around and every time the gas hits the wall of whatever container it's in, it's gonna exert some force, push out against it. That's the pressure. The pressure is just the force of the gas molecules whacking into the sides of the container. If I take that same amount of gas and I put it in a much bigger box, those same gas molecules are going to spend much more time zipping through space and a lot less time whacking against the walls. So I'm going to have much less pressure. If I take the same amount of gas and I put it even a smaller box, then I'm going to have even more pressure because I'm going to be spending way more time just whacking against the walls than I would have in this case. So it should feel kind of intuitive that if you take the same amount of gas and put it in a larger volume, the pressure goes down. If you put it in a smaller volume, the pressure goes up. And this is going to be at the core of pulmonary ventilation. And we're going to see how this works with your, with your lungs and your chest cavity. Okay, so again, remembering those pleura, there's the pleura around the lungs. There's the other layer of the pleura that's on the wall of your body. So together, this is my pleura. And remember, there's a section in between. So if my thoracic cavity changes size, there's going to be a suction that then will also pull the lungs along for the ride. That's going to be a critical part of this. And important to remember the diaphragm muscle. The diaphragm, when it's relaxed, has this kind of dome-like shape. When it contracts and it pulls, it actually goes down 
which will actually increase the volume of the thoracic cavity. That's gonna be the primary driver of your breathing is the diaphragm contracting. And as it contracts and pulls down, it's gonna increase the volume of your thoracic cavity. There are other muscles as well that can change the size of your thoracic cavity, the intercostal muscles, the scalenes, pectoralis minor that yank on your ribs. So there are other muscles as well that are doing this, but the diaphragm is the main player in breathing. And the basic process here, I'll just kind of lay it out. Step one, the diaphragm and some other, and other muscles will contract. You know, that is going to increase thoracic volume. So this is not changing the size of your lungs directly. This is just increasing the size of your thoracic cavity. But due to that suction of the pleura, that is now going to pull on the lungs and increase the volume of the lungs. due to the pleural suction. So now my lungs have increased volume. So no air has moved yet. This is really important. Right now, no air has moved. So what happens next? Now that the lung volume is big, what is, what's happening to the pressure in the lungs? It's gone down. Exactly. So now we have a lower pressure in the lungs. So now we have a low pressure zone in the lungs. We still have a higher pressure just out in the room. So if I have a high pressure and a lower pressure, the air is gonna flow from high to low pressure. So air flows into the lungs. So this is what we call negative pressure breathing. This is really different than blowing up a balloon, right? When you blow up a balloon, you're pushing air into a balloon. That increased amount of air in the balloon is increasing the pressure and then the balloon gets bigger. This is really different. This is you're first making the balloon bigger, which makes a low pressure zone and the air rushes in to equalize. So it's really important to understand the difference between this and what happens when you blow up a balloon. Right, and this, I can do this even with my, um, with my stomach. If I just use my abdominal muscles to increase the volume of my stomach, the air will rush down my esophagus and I can do my cool party trick. <coughs> Right? If you just increase the volume of your stomach, air rushes in down into your stomach and you can do cool burping sounds. Um, so this is what we call inhalation. How about, how do you think exhalation works? The opposite. It's gonna be the opposite. So the muscles relax. In fact, maybe I'll just do on another page. Muscles relax. Volume of the thoracic cavity goes down. Lung volume goes down. Um, the lung volume goes down because the lungs are naturally elastic and they are trying to get smaller. Um, so this is, this is all mainly passive. You know, you need to work to inhale, but to exhale, usually you just kind of relax and things just get smaller. Um, 
you know, then the pressure in the lungs goes up. So now if the pressure in the lungs is higher than the outside, the air flows out. So does that, that make sense? So that's at the core of pulmonary ventilation. You know, for normal breathing, the diaphragm only has to move like a centimeter or so. And the pressure differences are only like a few millimeters of mercury to drive quiet breathing. Obviously you can get more dramatic. <gasps> you know, we'll talk about that in our lab next week these forced inhalations and expirations where we have more dramatic movements of our muscles and changing the thoracic volume to create much stronger pressure differences. But for just quiet breathing, it's just a you know, centimeter or so of difference of the diaphragm moving, creating a few millimeters of mercury difference in pressure, which is enough to have a gentle flow of air into the lungs. And as you relax, get the increase of pressure and a nice flow out of the lungs. Um, what happens, it's like, oh no, somebody has just stabbed me or shot me in the chest and now I have a hole in my chest wall. What's gonna happen now? Is that going to prevent the lungs from being able to expand when the thoracic cavity expands? Exactly. That's going to break this suction here. It's going to break the pleural suction, right? The pleural suction is here. If, if all of a sudden air can rush in here, air will rush in the hole. The lung is, like I said, is naturally kind of elastic, would rather be smaller. So the lung, if it's no longer being held, out by that suction, I didn't mean to do that. If it's not being held there, the lung will collapse. Because there's no suction anymore to help hold it out against the wall of the thoracic cavity. Um, there's two words you should know related to this. One is pneumothorax. This just means that there is air in the interpleural space that breaks that suction. You know, it can happen either from a break in the outside wall. If you get shot or stabbed in the chest, you'll get a pneumothorax. You can also have a rupture from the internal part of the lung as well that can let air into there. The result is the same in either case. You break that suction and the lung collapses. The name, the official name for the collapsed lung is atelectasis. Right? And at this point, if you have a collapsed lung, it doesn't matter how much you try to breathe. You can drive your diaphragm up and down, drive your thoracic walls in and out. It's not going to be coupled to the movement of the lung anymore. So you're just going to have gurgling coming out of this hole, but you're not going to actually have the lungs pumping. So what do we do to like help this person? you need to create like some sort of artificial air thing, like a vent? And so there's, there's going to be two parts to it. One is you're going to have to seal up the hole. So we can restore, and then we're going to have to bleed out this space and restore the suction. There's usually like some little valvey thing that 
one-way valve that lets the air leave but doesn't let air come back in. So you have to restore the, you have to seal the breach and restore the suction, then you can start breathing again, right? Luckily, the two lungs have, the, or the two pleura are independent on the two sides. So you can actually have one collapsed lung without having the other lung collapse. So you can have one collapsed lung and just have really reduced ability to breathe, but still kind of limping along and you know, kind of restore the other side. Does that, so does that make sense? So pulmonary ventilation, you know, I promise you on your exam, there'll be some question asking you about how pulmonary ventilation works. Um, make sure you keep in mind kind of the, I'll say like causality. What causes what? Um, the place people get confused is they think like the air comes in and that's why the lungs are expanding, which is not true. What happens is the diaphragm contracts, which increases the thoracic volume, which increases the lung volume due to the pleural suction. And that is gonna decrease the pressure in the lungs. And only then does the air actually flow in due to that pressure difference. So like the last thing that happens is the air comes in. So when you're thinking about how ventilation works, it's about volume, changing pressure, then that pressure difference allowing the air to go do its thing. Like if you start like air comes in and the volume increases, it's like wrong, right? <laughs> That's like if you're blowing up a balloon or something. So please, like when you're kind of studying this, make sure you kind of keep track of what causes what. That's what I mean causality. What, what leads to what? The increase in thoracic volume leads to the increase in lung volume because they're coupled through that pleural suction. That increase in volume creates a low pressure zone in the lungs due to Boyle's law. That low pressure zone then drives the bulk movement of air from the room into your lungs. Um, the control of pulmonary ventilation is, might be different than you think. This is something we're gonna look at in our lab a little later this, this morning. So there are these breathing respiratory centers in the, in the pons and the medulla. They're kind of monitoring what's going on. And you know, some of these respiratory centers are just like little oscillators that are just kind of sending out messages, breathe, breathe, breathe. What is the name of the nerve that goes from the brainstem down to the diaphragm to drive your breathing? It was on your last exam. The vagus? No. There's another one you should definitely. The phrenic nerve? Yeah, the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve is the one that goes down to innervate the diaphragm, right? Unlike the heart, which will keep beating without anything, the, the diaphragm needs to be innervated by the phrenic nerve to keep contracting and keep you breathing, right? If anything damages that, like we talked about, if you have a spinal cord injury above C3, you're screwed because there's no messages coming down the phrenic nerve from the respiratory centers to drive your diaphragm contraction anymore. Um, that being said, the control of this, you might think it's driven by like levels of oxygen in your body. Oh, I need to breathe because my oxygen's getting low, but that's not true. 
This is going to be driven by CO2 levels. So as CO2 starts building up in your body, that is going to be the signal to these respiratory centers in your brain that I got to breathe. It's not about lose, it's not about how much oxygen. In fact, there's, you know, if you are in a room full of nitrogen and you just keep breathing in and out and in and out, as long as CO2 is not building up in your body, your brain isn't going to feel you need to breathe. In fact, you're just going to keep sucking in nitrogen until you just pass out and die of suffocation because you'll never have something going off like, oh my God, I'm suffocating. That feeling that I need to breathe is the rising CO2 levels in your body. Um, you know, we're gonna do this in our lab a little later today where we can like, if you're hyperventilating, like really not letting CO2 build up in your body and just blowing off lots of CO2, it takes a lot longer for the CO2 to build up to that level and you can hold your breath a lot longer. Um, you know, if you want to spend more, if you're like free diving, you want to spend a little more time down under the water, you don't want to overdo it, but you can, you know, hyperventilate, blow off more CO2, you can hold your breath longer. You know, if you overdo it, you can hold your breath so long that you pass out before you feel you need to breathe and you can like, you know, drown. So there's, there's a sweet spot there. Um, we can maybe, depending on the time, I can talk a little more about shallow water blackouts and things like that, which you got to worry about actually, if you're going to do this kind of thing. Um, but again, this is, Slightly not intuitive, but it's it's important. There's also these really funny, you can watch YouTube, like these people who are just breathing into this thing that's just scrubbing all the CO2. They're rebreathing. So the oxygen's going lower and lower, but there's no CO2 in their body that's building up. And you just see them, they're trying to talk, they're trying to write, and they just <laughs> like they don't even know. They're they everything just starts shutting down, but they don't know that they're suffoc they're, they're out of oxygen because that's not what they're monitoring. And as long as CO2 isn't building up, you know, they're feeling things are cool. So again, we will look at this in a little more detail in our lab today as well by altering the amount of CO2 in your body to start before you start breath holding and see how that affects your ability to hold your breath. Um, all right. So any questions about pulmonary ventilation? All right. So let's talk a little about once the air is in your lungs, how we actually get it into the bloodstream. Here's the trachea, the bronchi. And then we actually have lots and lots of branching. So these are my airways. The airways that are bringing the air down to the place, ultimately the place where the gas exchange is going to occur is the alveoli of my lungs. The alveoli these are the little things where we actually have super thin walls, simple squamous epithelium walls. You can't read that. Simple squamous 
epithelium. Again, these are my alveoli. One is an alveolus. You know, obviously on the other side of this are the capillaries, which are also made out of simple squamous epithelium. With my red blood cells. Um, the alveoli, these are where the actual gas exchange is occurring. We call this the respiratory zone. All of this other stuff is just about bringing the air down into the alveoli. This is what we call the conducting zone. Um, because air is, you know, in blood vessels, blood has pressure. It can hold the vessel open just by its own pressure. In the conducting zone, the trachea and the bronchi, you actually need to have physical reinforcement to make sure you keep the airways open. So we have like cartilage, rings, et cetera. to keep what we say, keep it patent. The word patent means just open. You want to keep your airways patent. Otherwise, they, the tubes close down and you can't breathe. Um, when you get to the smallest, smallest of the um, conducting zone, like the little bronchioles, wait, that's not what I meant to do. Bronchioles, just smooth muscle in the, in the wall. I should mention there's a lot of branching. There's like 23 orders of branching. As we go from the trachea to the primary bronchi to the secondary bronchi, all the way down, we're gonna end up with like 300 million alveoli at the end of all of this branching. The smallest little things, the bronchioles, I just misspelled it. Bronchioles with the smooth muscle. The reason why we actually, it's important that it's smooth muscle is this smooth muscle is controlled by your, by your, um, autonomic nervous system. Remember I was saying can dilate to, you know, if you wanna like have more flow, you can dilate the smooth muscle with sympathetic to decrease resistance and make it easier to get the air down into your lungs. If there's something noxious and you're trying to decrease the amount of air coming down, you can use parasympathetic to constrict this and get less of air coming down into your lungs. Um, asthma is an allergic reaction that causes a constriction of the smooth muscle. Again, what happens to the resistance to flow if the vessels are constricted, if these little bronchioles are constricted? It goes up. The resistance goes up, which means that you're gonna have less flow it means you're gonna to have to generate much bigger pressure differences to try to get the air both in or out of your lungs. So when someone is having asthma, you have decreased diameter of these bronchioles, increased resistance, you know, and the you know, flow is just gonna be the pressure difference over the resistance. So if resistance is going up due to the constriction of the bronchioles, you're going to need to increase the pressure difference in order to keep the flow going. Um, so that's, that's, that's kind of what's happening in asthma. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. I should also mention that there's a lot of dead space in here. Right, you're breathing in here, going down through these 23 orders of branching down into the smallest little bronchioles, finally down into here. You know, there is like about 150 liters of air that is just still stuck in the conducting zone that never makes it down into the, into the alveoli. When you exhale, you're exhaling part of the stale air, but you don't clear out all of the stale air. A lot of the stale air stays in this kind of one-way blind sac system. So, you know, the, the levels of CO2 that build up in your respiratory system are much higher than they are actually in the atmosphere. Um, so we'll, we'll talk more about that later. So what I'm going to do now, let me look at the time. Let's look at a little more detail what's happening here in the alveoli themselves. And our last little bit here is going to be, let's follow what happens that drives the movement of air from the alveoli into the bloodstream. And then what drives the movement of oxygen from the bloodstream into the tissues. So here's like one alveoli. They tend to be clustered around kind of like grapes. Um, again, we have this simple squamous epithelium. Um, let's put the capillary here. Now RBC. Notice this is as thin of a wall that we can make using the building blocks of a human body. Simple squamous epithelium for the alveolus, simple squamous epithelium for the, R, I mean, for the capillary. Um, there are actually two other kinds of cells in the alveolus I should mention. Um, one kind are the final level of defense against any dust or any particle that gets down into your lungs. There are these big macrophages, white blood cells, eating cells that are part of your immune system that are on patrol. So the alveolar macrophage. Or more commonly known as a dust cell. So even if you have dust that doesn't get caught in the mucus and makes it all the way down or any piece of smoke or whatever, these little guys are on patrol and will eat stuff and then remove it and take it out to some mediastinal lymph nodes or something and get rid of it. So the alveolar macrophages are on patrol in your lungs, cleaning things out. Um, the other thing is surface tension of water. Right? We know that water molecules pull on each other with their polar bonds. And at the scale of what we're looking at here in the alveoli, we have water surface tension where all these little water molecules are yanking on each other. All the little water molecules are pulling on each other. Overall, the effect is to basically have a overall force that collapses in the alveolus. In fact, it's so strong that if you don't do something to break that surface tension, it's too difficult to try to inflate your lungs. So there is this basically a detergent that is made by these other cells. They're called the surfactant cells that are in, they're more cuboidal looking. 
right? It's basically like a, think about phospholipids. It's an amphipathic molecule. One side gets polar, grabs onto the water, but then the other side's nonpolar. So now the water molecules are isolated from each other and they're no longer pulling on each other, right? So it deter that's how a detergent works. It has one side that's polar that goes towards the water, but then another side that is nonpolar. So now the water molecules don't pull on each other so strongly because they are basically capped off with these little detergent molecules. So we have less surface tension. So it makes it easier to inflate our, our lungs. Like when preemies are born, when babies are born too early, their lungs are not making this surfactant yet and they actually can't inhale because it's just too much surface tension to fight. So what they do is they have to like, they spray their lungs with surfactant and then they also put them on little itsy bitsy ventilators to make sure they keep breathing. Because without the surfactant, um, there's too much surface tension fighting the inflation of the alveolus. Um, blah, 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 blah. Uh, what else do I want to say about that? No, that's about it. So now let's talk about the oxygen. So the oxygen. And again, I should, let me repeat. There are three cells in here. One cell are the simple squamous cells that just make the wall. Two are these alveolar macrophages that are on patrol and that are cleaning up any little moats that get down in there. And three are these surfactant cells. And in the surfact, between this surface tension, there's also kind of elastic tissue around here. creates what we call like compliance, the stretchiness of the lung. Let me put that on it. So between that residual surface tension and this elastic tissue in the lung, that's what makes the lung stretchy. Um, that's what makes them also want to just collapse. Remember when you have the pneumothorax, the lungs collapse, it's because it naturally wants to get smaller. It's also why exhalation is passive. As the thoracic cavity is smaller, the lung naturally is just going to want to try to get smaller because it's naturally kind of stretchy and wants to kind of pull smaller. You know, if that lung compliance is not is not functioning properly, like people who have emphysema lose that compliance, lose that stretchiness, then they actually need to work to exhale. They can't just passively exhale. They actually have to generate pressure to exhale because the lung doesn't just naturally want to get smaller. So you should know this word compliance. Um, but back to So the air, what is air? I'm looking at the time. We are gonna, we're gonna get this done. What is air? Mixture. Mixture of? It's a bunch of different particles. And what are the main things that make up the air about you? Oxygen, O2. So there's oxygen. About how much of the air is oxygen? Do you want like a percentage? Yeah. 25%. Yeah, close. It's about 21% oxygen. Almost all the rest is nitrogen. And then little bits of other things. It's mainly nitrogen and about 20% oxygen. So when we're looking at the movement of oxygen, because we don't care about the movement of nitrogen. We care about the movement of oxygen. Um, what we need to do is look at the partial pressure of oxygen, which you just do like this. This is partial pressure. 
If you remember from chemistry, the Dalton's law of partial pressure says the partial pressure for any gas is just the proportion of the overall pressure that's due to the proportion of the gas that's made out of that particular molecule. So if I, in fact, let me just, I have the math here because I don't have to recalculate it. You know, if we have um, the air in the, um, in the room at one atmosphere, what is one atmosphere in terms of millimeters of mercury? Does anybody remember? Air pressure just at sea level? Standard temperature and pressure? Chemistry? People don't. Looks like about 760 millimeters of mercury is just kind of the air pressure. And then 21% of that is going to be, I have here, is 159. So this is the pressure of just due to oxygen that's in the air around you. But because I was saying that you have the mixing of the fresh air and the stale air in your lungs, when you get down into the alveoli itself, let me find my picture. When we get down into the actually alveoli, and let me clean up some of this mess in here. The partial pressure inside here is going to be it's around 100 millimeters of mercury. The partial pressure on this red blood cell that's returning from the tissues is about 40 millimeters of mercury, which means the oxygen is gonna move from the lung, from the alveoli onto into the red blood cell, right? It's driven because there's higher pressure of oxygen in this air you just inhaled versus the partial pressure of oxygen that's on the, on the um, blood that's returning from the tissue. This is like from the tissues. The reason why I'm kind of going through this is to make it clear why it's harder to breathe, like when you go up to Tahoe or up to higher altitudes, right? If you're going up to higher altitudes, the air pressure is lower, right? Air pressure, here's the earth, here's the atmosphere. The air pressure is just the weight of all the gas sitting on top of your head, right, from the, from the atmosphere. So if you're up, up on a mountain, there's less height of air above your head, so there's less overall air pressure. You know, the air's thinner. It's just the air pressure is lower. So if your air pressure is lower, that means the partial pressure of oxygen is lower. I have some, or I wrote down, I actually, Look this up. I could tell you. Yeah, if you're in Lake Tahoe, if you're in Lake Tahoe, the pressure is about 609 millimeters of mercury, which means it's even lower here. If you're on Mount Whitney, the highest point in the continental US, you're down to 429 millimeters of mercury, which means even way lower. It means it's going to be having a very low partial pressure of oxygen inside your alveoli, which means there's not going to be much of a pressure difference to drive the movement of oxygen from your lungs into your bloodstream, which means you're going to feel really out of breath all the time because the air, the oxygen is not transferring very efficiently from your lungs into the, into the blood. If you're on the top of Mount Everest, there is not enough pressure difference to actually stay alive without an oxygen tank. So anyway, that's that. Um, so 
I could go more. The, obviously, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is going to be the opposite. Car carbon dioxide is going to leave the blood and go back into the alveoli to be exhaled. In the interest of time, I'm not going to put those numbers down. But the reason why oxygen moves from your lungs into the blood is because there's a higher level of oxygen pressure in the lungs, in the alveoli, than on these red blood cells returning from the tissue. And therefore, oxygen gets into the blood. And then when we flow into the tissues, the opposite's going to happen. So let's do that. So here is my capillaries that have returning from the lungs. This is now my tissue. What is the partial pressure of oxygen in the red blood cells that have equilibrated with the alveoli? I mean, what's the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli? 100. 100. So they're going to keep absorbing oxygen till they are at 100, then they can't take on any more. So the partial pressure of oxygen here is going to be about 100 millimeters of mercury. And then they're going to deliver it to the cells. And they will deliver a bunch, but by the time they're done, they still have some oxygen left. And now they're at you know, 40 millimeters of mercury as they leave and return to the lungs. So one of the things that I want you to kind of realize from this is that our red blood cells pick up all this oxygen in the lungs. They top off their tank, so to speak. They deliver the oxygen into the tissues, but as they're coming back to the lungs, they still have some oxygen left. They don't give up everything. They're not down at zero. So there's this reserve and let me talk about that briefly. So does that make sense? It would be like if you fill up your bucket full of water and you go and you dump it out at the fire, but you don't dump the bucket all the way out. You dump it part way out, but then you go out back to the fountain to fill up your bucket again. Does that make sense? So this is gonna lead to I have something that's pretty cool, the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. Back. This is going to describe how tightly the hemoglobin holds on to the oxygen or lets it go into the tissue. Basically, the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen in the tissue. So let me show you this. It's pretty fun. I don't know how to do this better. I want this to actually be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
So for this to make sense, you have to think about percent saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen. If the hemoglobin is carrying the total maximum amount of oxygen that it can carry, we'd say it's at 100%. If the hemoglobin has zero oxygen attached to it, we'd say it's at 0%. This axis, the x-axis, is the partial pressure of oxygen that, is, that, the, that the hemoglobin is being exposed to. So if I have 100 millimeters, this is in millimeters of mercury, if I have 100 millimeters of mercury pressure outside, how much of the hemoglobin is going to be attached to oxygen? Think about being in the lungs. If you're in the lungs and it's 100 millimeters of mercury, partial pressure of oxygen, what's happening to the hemoglobin? Is it letting go? Is it picking it up? Picking it up. Right, that was the whole point, right? It, the reason why oxygen moved into the blood, 100 millimeters of mercury partial pressure of oxygen drove, you know, basically fully saturating the blood, the red blood cells with oxygen in the lungs. That's when you're loading up the oxygen on the red blood cells. So if I have 100 millimeters of mercury outside, my red blood cells are fully loaded with oxygen. And they're not going to let go of any either, right? There's, if, it's, if they're fully loaded and it's 100 outside, they're just going to hold on to it. There's no, there's no um, pressure difference to dry, have it leave. If I have zero partial pressure of oxygen on the outside, how much oxygen is going to be left in the blood? None. None. It's going to let go of all of it. If it's zero outside, basically you have this huge gradient that's going to drive the release of oxygen from the hemoglobin into the tissues, right? Is this making sense? It seems, it seems people are kind of not making sense. Let me kind of go back. Right here, I'm saying returning from the lungs, we have a these have 100 millimeters of mercury partial pressure. If they're traveling around in some zone where it's also 100 millimeters of mercury partial pressure, no oxygen is going to leave the blood and go out there. There's no pressure difference to drive the movement of oxygen to leave the blood into the tissue. If it was a vacuum out here, it was zero out here, it would all leave. There'd be zero left in the hemoglobin. You know, when it's 40, a lot of it leaves as well. So now let's go back to this picture and see if. So we were saying that when the blood is returning from the tissues, it's got about 40 millimeters of mercury partial pressure of oxygen still stuck on it. It turns out at that level of partial pressure of oxygen, we are still 75% saturated with oxygen. This is a very nonlinear graph. This means that the blood that's returning to the lungs to get topped off again, it's still got 75% of its original oxygen still bound onto it, right? You basically, we filled up the bucket to the top. We only dumped out a quarter of it, and then we went back to the lungs to top it off again. So th does that make sense? So, you know, we always draw that picture of the blood going to the lungs, picking up oxygen, going to the tissue, dropping off the oxygen, turning blue, coming back to the lungs to pick up more oxygen. But that is, that's, it's kind of misleading. The blood is going to the lungs, topping off oxygen, going to the tissue, 
and only letting go of about a quarter of its supply of oxygen and coming back to the lungs still loaded up with 75% of the original load. So it's never really picking up that much. Um, at least at rest, it's only picking up that extra 25% to top off again. However, if your tissues are being really metabolically active and need a lot more oxygen, the, the reason why this is good is that there's this big reserve. If we need to, we can deliver way more oxygen than you know, the normal kind of at rest system. So what kind of, what kind of, if there's a lot of metabolic activity in your cells, what kind of markers are we gonna notice? What kind of things are gonna result from lots of metabolic activity in your cells? Oh, come on. If, there's, if cells are being really metabolically active, working like crazy, doing stuff, what kind of things are gonna, you're gonna notice? You are Sherlock Holmes. Let's see, elementary, my dear Watson. I know that this cell has been metabolically active because I see Oh, come on. Cells doing lots of like cellular respiration. What are you going to see? They're going to have less O2, right? What, what's that? Going to be depleted in O2. Yeah, and like this, and what's related to that as well? So think about what's what's the formula for cellular respiration? Maybe I'm not asking this right. What would you see appearing if cells are running their mitochondria like crazy? Carbon dioxide? Yeah. You're going to have big increases in carbon dioxide. Right? Um, and because carbon dioxide, we're going to see in a few moments, actually gets converted to carbonic acid that's actually going to decrease the pH. It'll make things more acidic. Um, other things, you know, think about yourself. You've just ran and been working out. You're on your like cycle and spinning like crazy. Like, what are you noticing about yourself and the whole room and everything around you? What's, what's, Think about it. you're you're like starting to work out and now you're 15 minutes into your workout. What do you notice is different about you? Sweating. You're hot. You know, there's all sorts of all sorts of heat being, you know, and not all these processes generate waste heat, increases in temperature. Um there is also BPG, this is part of glycolysis. BPG goes up whenever there's fat, more glycolysis in cells, and this can be related to more um, thyroid hormone or uh, more growth hormone, um, catecholamines like adrenaline and stuff. So any of these things are indicators that there's more metabolic activity in the cells and that we're going to need more oxygen released into the tissue. If that happens, it will change the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. All of these decrease hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. Meaning in the same condition, 
Like if I am in the tissue at just 40 millimeters of mercury, instead of holding on to 75% of my oxygen, I might be letting go of way more of it. The whole pe people talk about the curve moving off to the right. Under all these conditions, if we have lower affinity of oxygen, we let go of more oxygen under the same conditions. So does this make sense? You've got, if you're just at rest, your blood is still holding on to 75% of its initial load when it delivers the oxygen. But if there are signs of increased metabolic activity, then we decrease the affinity of the hemoglobin for oxygen. And that makes the blood release more oxygen into the tissue. That, that makes sense? Okay. Um, all right, there's just one last thing that we'll do and we're gonna just say the end of the, of the system. So if we're going to transport oxygen in the blood, oxygen does not dissolve in water very well at all. This is pretty much all by hemoglobin. So the story for oxygen is simple. The story for CO2 which has to be picked up in the tissues and taken to the lung to get rid of is a little more complicated. About 30% is bound to hemoglobin. You know, this is on the heme. The oxygen is on that iron containing heme. The carbon dioxide is on that protein part, so they're not at the same binding site. Although the more carbon dioxide that is bound to the hemoglobin, the less the heme holds on to the oxygen. That's part of this process of changing the affinity of the hemoglobin for oxygen, right? The more carbon dioxide that's around, the less tightly the hemoglobin is holding the oxygen. Kind of that's what we just talked about. Um, carbon dioxide also dissolves in water. That's how you get Coke and Pellegrino and stuff like that. So maybe 10% is just dissolved in plasma, just in the water of the plasma. Which leaves us the main part, mostly, mostly as bicarbonate ion. And the way this works is this. CO2 gets into your bloodstream, combines with water and becomes carbonic acid, H2CO3. This is catalyzed. There's actually a enzyme in the red blood cells called carbonic anhydrase. That turns the CO2 into carbonic acid. Carbonic acid we've already talked about on the first week of class as a weak acid. This will dissociate into H plus plus HCO3 minus, this is the bicarbonate. So when the carbon dioxide is in high concentration, this reaction goes this way. This is what's happening in your tissue. 
It turns into this bicarbonate in your bloodstream. When you get to the lungs where the partial pressure is the other way, we're gonna blow off the carbon dioxide, then this reaction goes the other way. But this is the way that carbon dioxide is being transported in your blood. It gets converted to bicarbonate when it goes into the blood and then goes from bicarbonate back into carbon dioxide to get exhaled in your lungs. You can also see why changing the amount of bicarbonate or the amount of CO2 in your body is going to change the pH of your blood, right? Because the higher the concentration of CO2, the more H plus you got. So when we talk about pH balance, we're going to revisit this because we'll see just by changing, by having or doubling your pulmonary ventilation, you can actually increase or decrease your blood pH by like 0.2 or so up or down. So does that make sense? All right, so um, I should, for just completeness, We'll talk about filtering of inhaled air, that through the nose hairs. We talked about through the mucus. We talked about the dust cells and the actual alveoli. What's another way you have to remove stuff that gets into your respiratory passages? Coughing it up. Yeah, exactly. So for lower respiratory passages, a cough. You're taking stuff from the lower parts of the respiratory system and getting rid of it. What's the difference between a cough and a sneeze? Coming from the lungs versus coming from the sinuses. No, both cases it's an explosive blast from the lungs. Where does it exit? Where does a sneeze exit? Your no nostrils. Yeah, so a sneeze is made of, it's more about trying to clear out your upper respiratory passages, like your nasal cavities and stuff. So if you're trying to clear out the lower respiratory passages, you'll blast out through the mouth. If you're trying to clear out the upper respiratory passages, you're gonna blast out through the nose. Right, and we didn't, I didn't really talk about the larynx as much as I wanted to, but basically your vocal cords can close down, it's called the glottis. So you can actually close the entrance to the, to the trachea, build up lots of pressure and then release the glottis and let that big blast come out. Right, you also close the glottis if you're just trying to bear down and do a bowel movement. You don't want like the air leaving. Um, so, so we've been, you know, I realize, you know, it's a lot of material, you know, there's more we could talk about, but I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to stop. I might, you know, it might be next, next week, we'll talk a little more just to, um, fill in some loose, loose parts, but let's say,